Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for this webinar today. Uh, this is our first in a series of uh, three different webinars organized by 2030 Water Resources Group in collaboration with the Kenya Private Sector Alliance. And these webinars uh, will be focusing on three main sectors. Um, the first webinar today, which is looking at the water supply and sanitation services sector, is looking at how can we accelerate private sector engagement within the water and sanitation space. Um, the second one, which will be happening in another two weeks, will be focusing on accelerating um, farmer-led irrigation development to expand small-scale irrigation in Kenya. And the third one will be looking at wastewater treatment and the circular economy. And this is our series of three webinars that will be organized in collaboration with the Kenya Private Sector Alliance. And um, just to take us through the, today's webinar, our main objective is to explore the finance and technological um, opportunities for public government and private sector to work together to accelerate water and sanitation services access for the people of Kenya. We'll also be looking at the policy, legal and regulatory frameworks that enable or create that enabling environment to allow private sector to invest in the water and sanitation space. And lastly, to identify, so what are the existing bottlenecks that are hampering or hindering increasing private sector participation? Um, to, to take us through the agenda, I'd like us to just focus on, on the next slide to see how we've organized this webinar into three main sections. So the first section will comprise of the first 30 minutes will focus on presentations from key speakers who will be looking at, so what is the current context? What is the situation currently when it comes to public and private partnerships in the water services space? Um, the second one will give us a, an overview of what are the policy and legal and regulatory frameworks that are existing to accelerate PPPs in the water and sanitation space. And the last presentation will be focusing on where are the opportunities for private sector to participate. After that, we'll have another 30 minutes, minutes to focus on our moderated panel discussion. And this has brought in speakers from um, government side, both the national government and also the local government. Um, we'll also have speakers from the private sector side and the implementing partners looking at um, some of the non-state actors that we have. And after that, we'll have 20 minutes focused on question and answer uh, with our panelists and also our presenters. And five minutes to the end of the webinar, we will close. Um, if you can go back to the previous slide. Um, so at the end of this webinar, what do we want to be able to achieve? We want to have a better understanding of the landscape of opportunities for private sectors engagement in the water and sanitation space. We also have, want to have a better understanding of what is the legal policy and regulatory framework that is governing private sector participation and where are the opportunities to engage directly with the water companies or our water utilities and regulators in the water and sanitation sector. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our um, key guest who will open this uh, tripartite series. And um, I'd like to welcome Emily Whiter, who's the chair of the Environment Sector Board within the Kenya Private Sector Alliance, under which water falls under, and also the Director of Public Affairs, Communications and Sustainability in East and Central Africa at Coca-Cola Africa. Welcome, Emily. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you, Joy, for that introduction. Um, I'm looking forward to, to these sessions. Uh, um, so I'd just like to first of all, um, uh, uh, greeting, pass greetings on to the, uh, the World Bank team and the 2030 World Resources Group uh, team, the business leaders present on this call, private sector members, water service providers, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So on behalf of uh, Kenya Private Sector Alliance, uh, that's KEPSA, I would like to acknowledge the longstanding partnership between uh, private sector development partners and uh, government in advancing sustainable economic growth. So I'll give you a little bit of um, background on how KEPSA works and you know, the context in which we are enjoined in this meeting. So we are the umbrella body of uh, the private sector in Kenya to drive economic development through uh, year on year improvements in business environment by addressing cross cutting business issues, driving investments and also addressing socioeconomic issues with partners. So it brings together business associations, corporate bodies, SMEs, startups to speak as one voice and, and, and working closely with corporate bodies, SME, um, the, the, same, the same business community 
together with government and other stakeholders through a structured public private um, dialogue platform and other engagement mechanisms. So KEPSA's public private policy dialogues are institutionalized from the sector boards as the basic units of public private dialogue process with other stakeholders. So sector boards are the initial point of contact between KEPSA, KEPSA members and the government for influencing policy and business environment. So environmental sustainability, of course, for our members has real economic, social, ecological and uh, political value. So integration of water, natural resources and environmental regulation plans and programs into the national economic and social development is therefore paramount for us. So um, our sector board is called uh, the, the Environment, Water and Natural Resources Sector Board. And it is charged with ensuring that the private sector has a con conducive policy and legal framework for environmental sustainability including water and sanitation. So water and sanitation concerns for the private sector around um, governance of water and sewerage services, wastewater treatment, water catchment areas protection rehabil and rehabilitation, urban water supply, rural water supplies, community water projects, uh, rehabilitation of urban rivers, irrigation, water quality, pollution control. I could go on, it's, it's really a lot. Um, I'm very glad to report that as a sector board, uh, we've made key contributions to the policy frameworks of the sector as a task force member for water policy, water regulations, and is currently a task force member for the development of the sanit um, sanitation policy. Uh, there's a lot more I could say, um, in, including the fact that we are very eager to continue driving public private partnerships for, for, for the water sector. Um, because we find we think it is a viable approach in promoting investments in, in, in public service as well. And despite there being regulatory and operational frameworks for the implementation of, of, of the PPPs, there has been inadequate private sector participation. So towards this end, KEPSA discussed the need for review of the PPP Act during the eighth presidential round table. And we are glad to report that uh, yesterday on 25th February, 2021, the cabinet considered and approved for transmittal to parliament, the private public private partnership, partnership bill 2021. So this is an area really to, um, to look into. So KEPSA has partnered with World Bank, um, World Bank's 2030 Water Resources Group for equipping private sector with knowledge and for creation of awareness with the objective of accelerating private sector participation in Kenya's water sector. Um, covering water supply, circular economy in water, expansion of irrigated agriculture land. And so today's webinar is focusing on water and sanitation. And, and, and it's my hope that the session will not only provide this information, but also ignite private sector to in, invest in water and sanitation. So thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And um, I wish uh, all of us a great engagement in the, in the three sessions. Thank you very much, our, our chair, Emily, uh, for that good exposition of uh, the Environment, Water, and Natural Resources Sector Board at KEPSA and the mandate and the scope under which the water matters are actually covered. So my name is Faith Ngige, uh, the Public Private Dialogue Officer for the Environment, Water, and Natural Resources Sector Board at KEPSA. I will take you through the next session of the, of the webinar. And at this point, we'll be having great uh, exposition from key panelists and specialists in public-private partnerships in water and sanitation sector, as well as um, just an exposition of the legal framework, uh, framework that guides uh, public-private partnerships in this sector. So I'd encourage you to be able to use the, the chat section of the webinar. Uh, should you have questions that you wish to direct to the speakers, or should anything that uh, you feel needs to be brought to our attention, then kindly use the, the chat section. So we'll be having three speakers and I will want to invite the first speaker, who is Mr. Jan Jensen, the Managing Director of JJJ Advisory Services and formerly Technical Advisor of Water at the Kenya National Treasury, the Public Private Partnerships Unit. Welcome, Mr. Jen. Thank you. Happy to be here. 
Okay, I apparently the first slide is already there. So first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. And uh, I recognize a few colleagues with whom I have worked together in the past. It's nice. So I have a very short period of time to introduce the topic. So for, without further ado, I will try to convey a few messages. Um, the first is basically just to set the scene. Uh, the public-private partnership is basically a contract between a public sector institution and a private party in which the private party assumes substantial financial technical operational risks in the design, financing, building and operation of a project. So this is a legalistic statement, but it's good to have that in mind. Next slide, please. So it is a fact and an observation that PPPs in the water sector are basically lagging behind PPPs in the other infrastructure sectors. So that is unfortunate, but there are good reasons which explain this. And um, before we go into that problem, it is maybe good to illustrate very quickly the benefits, the expected benefits of a PPP in water and sanitation. And um, I would especially single out the middle block, increase operational efficiency and innovation, because this is one of the key issues in the water sector compared to the other infrastructure sectors that the unfortunate efficiency in operation and commercial management is not that good, which is a very big hindrance to introduce PPPs. Next slide, please. So it's good to set the scene. What are we discussing? And um, so basically we have two families, big families, but the full spectrum goes from the left side where there's a traditional relationship with the private sector, which happens since many years with consultants, uh, contractors, etc., tenders for construction and service contracts. Now the middle block is basically the PPP area where we, where we address our attention. And there you can see that there is the, the, the rectangle which is dotted blue and the rectangle which is brown or black dotted. The first family is manager contracts, operating contracts, lease and affair measures. Some consider service contracts also part of this, others say it is not a PPP. That's another conversation, another discussion. But you see the group of manager contracts, delegate operation contracts and leases and affirmage are basically PPPs who focus on improving operations, efficiency and effectiveness. The other block, concessions, BOT, etc., are basically PPPs to build new infrastructure or to rehabilitate existing infrastructure. That's a different family. And unfortunately, that family in the water sector is very difficult to take off because of the inefficiencies, as I mentioned before. Now, there is a last family which is emerging and is receiving increasing interest is the so-called joint ventures of joint stock companies with the private public combination of uh, investments and equity and debt. That's a model which I will not address now, but it is to be considered and it's of interest. It's originated in, in Spain and Latin America, but now you see elsewhere in the world increasing interest in this modality. So next slide, please. As I said, there are two groups, two main categories. You have the first group infrastructure provision models, as I said, to build new infrastructure or rehabilitate existing, the so-called green and brownfield projects. And you have the other group, operational and delivery models. It's also called sometimes the DPS family, delegation of public service. These are the management contracts, operation contracts, lease and affirmage, as I mentioned. The point is that in the situation where efficiencies are not good or effectiveness could be much improved, it's a challenge to move directly in an infrastructure provision model. Hence, 
Next slide. I would really try to convey the message that you should, in the water sector, definitely have priority attention for improving efficiency, quality of service, etc., and related matters before you could go to the BTO and BOT and DBF, etc. You could call it, you use PPPs for efficiencies to unlock private sector finance. The concession is sitting on horseback. Some say concession is an open-ended BOT. That's another discussion. But that is just a visualization of the challenge. Now, in practice, if you move to an infrastructure for, let's say, a new dam or a new plant, etc., the preparation time, or some say the incubation period, is a few years, very often more than a few years. And the the message here is that you should use that preparation period for a, a, a BPP for infrastructure to address efficiency problems so that you maximize the, the usage of the incubation time, the preparation time to improve your efficiency so you better position yourself to unlock private sector finance and to move into what is now some sometimes called to bridge the infrastructure gap. I think this is a very key message. And I would say this is an important, I find very important, um, um, let's say, recommendation. Next slide, please. Now, if we move in the family of efficiency improvements, there is no miracles. It's always the four priority actions. It's commercial efficiency, the efficiency of the infrastructure, the losses, the leakage, energy efficiency, and staff productivity. That the last one is a very sensitive issue. So I would say the lowest hanging fruit is improving commercial efficiency and improving, reducing the leakages, the non-revenue water in the, in the distribution network. This Two are the two most priority actions. And if you address this, as I mentioned, during the two, three, four years incubation preparation time for an infrastructure PPP, I think you can try to combine the benefits of both approaches. Next slide, please. So this is the same, but in a different way to present this. This is taken from the utility turnaround framework, and you see in the right bottom uh, quadrant, the low cost, high impact. There, I think you should try to prioritize your PPP's intervention to, address, as I said, non-revenue water and commercial management, and then move forward. Next slide, please. Now, this is to close this short introduction. As I said, you have the choice between service contract, manager contracts, operation contracts, lease affirmations, and then the infrastructure project, BOT, ROT, the design, build, finance, operate. Now, you can say, what do you want to achieve? Improve services, improve efficiency. So this is a one group of objectives you can have. Next. You can also say, I would like to fast track some actions and you see the lease affirmage here is is quite the, the best approach if it is feasible the last one yes is leverage public sector finance to attract commercial finance and there you have to of course the bot so you see the groups of ppp modalities you have to also to look what do i need to achieve what do i want to achieve and that also will determine the selection. So in summary, the message of this slide is, if you want to go for PPP for new infrastructure, please address efficiency and effectiveness during the preparation period, I repeat, and then the PPP modality of choice is manager contracts, lease affirmations, and then you, can, you graduate or you move into the BOT or design build finance operate modality. Next. So 
again, the same message, but in a different way to present this. The initial steps with the PVP is to move from a non-bankable situation and trying to move fast to a situation where you can unlock private sector finance and you can unlock PPPs for new infrastructure. And that means you have to address performance, but also governance is an important element. And that leads to efficiency and cost recovery. And then you create your service provider in a more bankable logic. I'm aware that this is very dense. And actually from on this slide, you can have more than a half an hour discussion on how to make this happen in practice. Next slide. Yes, that is the logic. So as a conclusion of this introduction, a PVP in itself is not an objective, it's an instrument. And I would say there is still a lot of opposition sometimes in civil society and elsewhere. And we should always keep in mind that the PVP is an instrument. It's a means to an end. It is the process by which this objective we would like to realize is the rationale to apply a PPP. And that is important to keep in mind. So I hope that with this short introduction, I have set the scene. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Jean. Uh, the exposition you have given us indeed demonstrates uh, your professional professional experience for over 40 years in the industry. And as you can rightly uh, see, there's a lot of interest from our participants and hopefully they can be able to engage further. So thank allow you. me to, thank you. So allow me to invite Dr. Nathan Rono to missing the police uh, from the National Treasury. He is the legal expert and head of legal function at the Public Private Partnership Unit at the National Treasury in Kenya since 2013. He has over 24 years of experience as a PPP legal expert and development consultant, and he was a PhD in law from the University of Warwick in the United Kingdom. He will expand to us the policy, legal, and regulatory environment for PPPs. Welcome, Dr. Rono. Thank you so, so much, and a very good morning, um, colleagues. Um, I think Jan has done an excellent job of uh, introducing uh, the overall concept of PPPs. Um, some of these uh, observations um, interface with some of my slides, so that should help um, us move a little uh, fast. Um, I want to thank the 2030 Water Resources Group Africa for inviting the participation of the PPP Directorate in this um, webinar series. Um, at the PPP Directorate, we are all about trying to enable PPPs in Kenya, and uh, we therefore welcome the opportunity um, to contribute to discourses such as this uh, that um, together add um, to the possibility of actualizing um, these objectives. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Um, we have um, essentially been invited um, to speak to the theme of the legal, regulatory, and policy framework that enables PPP implementation in Kenya. And um, we will do exactly that. Um, we have uh, pitched this as an introductory level discussion. Um, we'll be happy to take um, more in-depth questions in the uh, Q&A uh, session. And we'll focus on the structure of the legal policy and institutional framework for PPPs in the country. Um, we'll also uh, reflect on the available PPP contract models for water and sanitation projects uh, in the PPP space and um, uh, hopefully get a moment to reflect on some of the issues that we have seen in this subsector uh, in the past. Let's move to the next slide. Um, we would look at PPPs as one way, um, as Jan has correctly stated, um, of addressing pressing public development issues, uh, particularly the generation of public goods in the form of public infrastructure projects. Um, so Jan has correctly said that uh, this must be seen as a means to an end, not an end in themselves. Um, and um, obviously uh, the Water Resources Group has identified a series of issues and constraints that impair the water and sanitation sector. There's a problem of high energy costs. There's a question of low revenue streams. Uh, which have um, impaired to a varying degrees uh, the ability to expand 
the network or to improve the quality of service in terms of reliability. And then there's the issue of high non-revenue water. Um, and we understand this to be a factor of uh, the aging water infrastructure, um, inefficient billing systems, illegal connections, uh, as well as poor asset management. PPP deal structures, in our view, can help provide fairly catalytic solutions to quite a number of these issues. And I think in the spectrum of uh, deal uh, typologies that Jan has identified, um, we've got um, the light touch PPPs focusing on what Jan has called the service delivery uh, operational type PPPs, um, as opposed to um, the high capex investment transactions. And, and in the full spectrum of uh, possible uh, solutions, um, the PPP legal framework in this country actually makes it possible to lock in PPP uh, solutions that would help address some of the pressing needs of the sector. But there are challenges. And I think when we speak to some of the constraints, uh, we will address some of the issues that tend to impair ability to do deals. Um, and then together we can reason and find potential approaches to making this framework uh, more fit for purpose. Uh, let's have the next slide. Um, so we are essentially saying that PPPs can help uh, unlock inefficiencies, they can help provide missing links, uh, they can help remove bottlenecks. Um, but these were essentially the fundamentals that informed the structure of the PPP policy uh, back in 2011. Uh, there was um, the context, of course, was essentially that the country um, had doubled to varying degrees in PPPs and had um, a mixed record of successes and failures. Uh, it was felt back in 2010 that um, perhaps Kenya needed a better structure in its approach to PPPs. Um, there was also a growing recognition that the yearning infrastructure funding gap um, was something that was not going to be addressed purely on the public sector balance sheet. And the intention was therefore to try and create an avenue for the private sector, which at the time and even today uh, was growing in exponential uh, quantums, uh, there was need to find mechanisms for locking in private sector mo uh, capital mobilization. But there was also need to, and recognition in the public sector space, um, essentially to lock in private sector efficiencies, um, lock in private sector innovation. Um, we've been told uh, numerous times that government is a bad business person or a bad businessman, and that um, when we have um, commercially viable public uh, undertakings, uh, locking in private sector participation is a strategic uh, and a wise idea. So those, those issues were recognized as uh, core fundamental uh, policy drivers. Uh, and all of these elements were built into the PPP policy 2011. That policy identified the need to adopt a PPP law. Now, the PPP Act 2013 was adopted um, both as a procedural law as well as a substantive law. Um, in terms of procedure, the law actually details how a PPP should be originated, how a PPP should be undertaken, uh, the steps to be followed, it establishes a very sequential process. It also tells us who originates a deal, who approves it. And once it is approved, what are the next steps? So it structures the PPP project cycle. It delineates who the actors are in the process. It determines when critical regulatory approvals need to be locked in in a PPP deal structure um, and establishes an overall compliance framework. In terms of the substantive principles, that the PPP law in Kenya adopts, um, we see the principle of value for money as an, in, in integrate, as an integral component of PPP deal making in the country. We see the concept of affordability of PPP transactions, affordability to the public sector, affordability to the end users. Uh, we see issues to do with risk transfer as a core value driver in PPP decision making. We see guarantee in public service delivery because public private partnerships, as Jan correctly described, is a partnership between the public and the private sector. 
but it is a partnership over a public function, fundamentally a public function. And the performance of the public function is the nexus with the public service delivery value chain. Um, and that delivery must be driven by a cost effectiveness uh, objectivity, as well as a sustainability agenda. All of these substantive principles define the structure of how we appraise PPP projects, how we evaluate them in a procured outcome, how we negotiate the contract, and how we determine whether uh, contract variations in terms of renegotiated transactions um, continue to sustain the core PPP values. The PPP law also establishes uh, what we could consider to be the institutional and governance framework for PPPs. So it establishes the PPP committee as oversight institution and mandates it to issue all required approvals under the act. It establishes the PPP unit. Now it's been elevated to a PPP directorate uh, to give it more clout in terms of PPP process leadership. Um, and it gives certain roles to the cabinet as well in terms of the policy framework around PPPs. At the transactional level, um, it establishes contracting authorities who are the primary counterparties in a PPP deal structure. And the contracting authorities are responsible for PPP project development, uh, processing, and everything in between. And it works through a node structure, a PPP node, a project appraisal team, tender evaluation bodies, contract negotiation teams, as well as project management teams. In addition to the governance framework, it actually uh, puts into place a very structured um, regime on what we could consider to be the uh, core gatekeeping principles in every PPP deal structure. So it basically requires that a project concept note should be approved, a feasibility study should be approved both for fiscal commitments and contingent liabilities, as well as for PPP viability. Uh, the procurement uh, framework is subject to various approvals. The contract negotiation stage is also subject to various approvals. Contract variations subject to various approvals. Project management subject to various oversights. All of these issues together comprise the PPP gatekeeping mandate and framework. Um, the law also uh, sets down the uh, procurement methods that could be applied in PPP project uh, undertaking. Uh, and it essentially sets down two methods, boils down to open competitive tender and unsolicited PPP transactions. The unsolicited framework is regulated by a concept called privately initiated investment proposals under the act, um, which has historically not been as well developed um, and as clear as it could be, actually it's one of the things that is being picked up in the PPP Amendment Bill 2021. Um, two more or three more key principles that the PPP law does is essentially to set down the PPP contract models. Um, and Ian has given us an overview of uh, potential PPP deal structures. Um, the PPP Act actually establishes under the second schedule, about 13 different PPP contract models. Um, and it allows for a very diverse and very dynamic uh, portfolio of potential deal structures for uh, PPPs in water and sanitation. Um, but the law also sets down minimum contract terms that must be carried in every PPP transaction. So all of these issues become part and parcel of the legal and policy framework that govern the implementation of PPPs. Lastly, um, the PPP law uh, establishes a principle that PPP projects in Kenya need to be delivered through a project company or a special purpose vehicle structure, which is project finance oriented um, and comes with its own challenges. The point we are making, ladies and gentlemen, is that the legal framework in this country for PPPs is reasonably clear, it's reasonably stabilized, is being tested um, and it's beginning to demonstrate that it can work. It has constraints. Quite a number of those constraints are currently subject to addressing through the um, PPP Amendment Bill 2021. I think in a nutshell, what we are saying is that the law in Kenya is in, on matters PPP is a unified legal framework. Um, the PPP Act is overarching law on PPPs and it regulates PPPs at both the national and county levels. 
um, it does not regulate in specific terms sector specific PPP deal structures, but it does not preclude sector nuances in PPP deal making. And I think that's a very important point to make uh, because the law in this country does not create a specific regime for water PPPs. And that's important because it potentially drives some of the constraints that we see. We will not spend too much time here. I think um, the answer has basically uh, identified some of the potential types of PPPs. And I think in my beginning slide, we had mentioned that um, uh, PPP solutions can be catalytic to some of the challenges facing the water sector, water and sanitation sector. Uh, for non-revenue water and building uh, problems, uh, for instance, uh, the lightage forms of PPP contract models under the second schedule to the act apply. For efficiency improvements, management contracts, leases, output-based performance contracts also uh, add value and uh, are available for potential consideration. If we are talking about system improvements or require uh, transactions in water and sanitation that require the injection of new capex uh, or whole system operations, uh, perhaps the concession PPP model um, would be more ideal or more uh, adapted. Uh, and if we are talking about locking in new capacity, um, bulking water treatment, uh, long distance uh, pipeline systems or storage solutions, then you're looking at the more hardcore uh, PPP contract models, uh, which are also more complex, uh, require um, um, demand more uh, in terms of structuring requirements. Um, and these are the BOTs, the build on operate transfer, build on transfer, develop operate transfer, rehabilitate operate transfer, build, transfer, operate, and similar deal structures. Look, the key point we are making here is that it is not the contract models that is the problem in water and sanitation PPPs. In my view, um, it is largely, I think, the institutional, uh, financial, and legacy issues in the water and sanitation sector that we need to be thinking more about. But the key message is that we have flexibility. Let's move to the next slide. Um, what we are essentially trying to say here in summary is that um, the PPP legal framework in Kenya is enabling of PPPs in water and sanitation. If we look at the Water Act 2016, section 93 is very explicit. It provides that PPPs can be done for water and sanitation projects. If you look at the County Government Act 2012, uh, section six, subsection two, we see clarity that county governments at the subnational level can actually undertake PPPs. And when we look at the PPP Act, we see it establishing the unified legal framework on both the substantive and procedural elements. Um, but from a constitutional perspective, we know that water is a devolved function. Uh, some of those mandates remain with the national government. Um, the question uh, for uh, the water sector uh, and sanitation um, is essentially, uh, one of entry point. Uh, and I think Jan um, sort of alluded um, to the logic in terms of how to grow a country's um, a portfolio of PPPs in water and sanitation. And I think he placed his finger on um, what he calls um, operational and service oriented PPP models as opposed to the infrastructure provision PPP models. And I think I'd like to second that. Um, to a large measure, because we have seen in this country, I think um, if um, one would look at the PPP pipeline of projects in Kenya, um, about 20 or 23 percent of the pipeline related to um, large capex water and sanitation projects, um, which have actually never gained traction over time. And I'll tell you why. Um, from where we sit, the challenges have been around the large viability gap funding requirements um, to bridge the capex uh, 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 threshold um, to achieve bankability. And, and given the constrained fiscal space, that has been a bit of a challenge. I think there's a massive opportunity for um, operation level PPPs to bridge the non-revenue water question and to improve uh, service delivery and potentially um, lock in elements of network expansions. And I think 
um, there is a big challenge around um, the question of determining the entry point. I think in, in, um, in, in the hierarchy of needs, uh, the challenge has always been, what do we do first? Do we lock in additional capacity in terms of bulking and treatment? Um, or do we uh, improve the quality of service for those already connected to water services? Uh, the statistics are not very pretty. Uh, if less than 60% have access to water um, and less than 24% have access to sanitation services, we clearly have a problem. Um, and no answer is easy. Uh, but the point we are making is that we need ultimately to balance the question between affordability and need um, and, and address our minds to the question of cost, revenue, and tariffs that may not necessarily be cost reflective. I think the other issue is essentially the, uh, the unified framework for PPPs um, and, and the non-segregation or non-delineation um, of, of uh, PPP typologies per sector. Uh, so what that does is essentially to say that the core PPP values on affordability value for money, risk transfer, service delivery, um, uh, and everything in between apply to water sanitation PPPs, just like they do to an energy sector PPP or a, or a road sector PPP or a port transaction. The implication essentially is that from a deal making perspective, the regulatory cost may actually be disproportionate for water and sanitation PPPs. And that we realize is a practical challenge and an issue that uh, we need to think about in terms of determining whether we actually do need uh, flexibility for low capex uh, water PPPs and sanitation PPPs. Um, and what we are essentially saying is that these are some of the practice problems that we do need to think about. I think another critical point is that because of the, um, shall we say, dichotomy between um, viability and tariff adequacy, um, what we tend to see in water and sanitation deal structures is that um, there's usually a requirement for varying levels of what we call government support measures. Um, either by way of government letters of support, um, credit guarantees, um, or things to do with viability gap funding. Um, and given the challenges of, of, of uh, fiscal sustainability on the fiscal commitment content liability prerogatives of the country, uh, this continues to present an existential challenge, if I may say, in terms of deal making for this uh, subsector. Um, the fiscal commitment content liability framework in Kenya is in place, but it remains a work in progress. Um, so its efficacy, certainty, and predictability in application is something that, um, you, that we need to deal with. Um, and uh, one of the other things, of course, is a question of timing and interfacing. Um, and what we are basically saying is that um, we do need to take some of these issues into account. Um, I think what we, let's move to the next slide. I know our time is running out. Yes, you um, do Thank you, Dr. Yes, yeah. you do that. Kindly have a minute to wrap up. I know the yes, subject yes. is in depth. Uh, we can always uh, discuss in depth another time, but just wrap up for us, please. No, absolutely, absolutely. Um, actually, I think um, we are on course to wrapping up in under two minutes. Um, one of the, um, I think about three or four points really that um, we just want to throw out there in terms of uh, water and sanitation PPPs um, is that um, there seems in our experience and observation to have been a challenge around um, particularly subnational PPPs, which would be the arena for uh, the entry point. Uh, for PPP execution in this country in, that, in terms of the water and sanitation sector. In the um, wake of devolution uh, and the transfer of functions, there was an issue around the transfer of assets and liabilities that was not uh, properly done. And that raises a question on um, certainty uh, for deal making uh, and risk uh, appetite for the private sector. There's also a question of debt assignments between the national and county governments um, and it's more an issue of missing formalizations, uh, absence of deeds of assignments, uh, impact on ownership and responsibility issues, 
uh, which also have a fundamental impact in terms of the ability of the private sector to price their risks when they get into these spaces. And so for water and sanitation PPPs across the board, uh, viability uh, and affordability sit at the center of the issues. Data availability and PPP readiness at the contracting authority level represent some of the other challenges. And so in my view, really to lock up, uh, to lock in traction for PPPs in this sector, I think low capex uh, water and sanitation PPPs should lead the way um, as we get into this space. So essentially, in conclusion, we are saying that uh, our legal framework, next slide, please. I think that's our last slide. Um, the legal framework in Kenya for PPPs in the water and sanitation sector, I believe is reasonably well clarified. Uh, the process cycle uh, for PPPs for this sector um, is bundled into those five uh, key milestones and these apply across the board for uh, all, uh, all PPPs. Um, questions of affordability, as we've said, um, uh, sit at the center of the concerns in terms of any deal structuring in this regard. Issues touching on the county uh, spaces, um, like we've uh, outlined, uh, require attention to address those legacy issues in order to promote uh, private sector confidence um, in this particular space. So we are essentially saying we are open to business. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Rono, for all that you have told us, clearly elaborating the legal and policy framework for PPPs in the country and some of the challenges, including the devolution question. I believe our participants will engage with you in the next session. So allow me to invite Mr. Anthony Ambugo, who will now give us a private sector perspectives and opportunities in water and sanitation services. Kindly, Mr. Anthony, take us through in the next 10 minutes. He's the Chief Executive Officer of the Water Service Providers Association and is very passionate about water and sanitation governance. Welcome, Mr. Anthony. Thank you very much. I don't know if I'm audible enough. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank the presenters who have presented. I've realized that uh, we have a very elaborate framework on PPC, PPPs, especially the focus on water and sanitation space. Now, uh, because of time, I want just to give the brief background of WASPA. It was established almost 18 years ago as a premium umbrella body of all water companies in the Republic of Kenya. As you are aware, there are regulated 88 water utilities in the, in the country. So WSPs are uh, county government owned utilities. They are established by dint of Article 77 of the Water Act 2016, but most of them are registered under the Companies Act 2015, those who are formed under the Companies Act. We have a few which are formed under other uh, legislation in the country. So our membership is 76 for substantive members that are the WSPs, but we also have a room for other associates, individual and students around 39. So the mission of WASPA is to facilitate an enabling environment for the WSPs. And we do this through capacity building and focusing networking partnerships and promotion of best practices. But it is important to realize that the mandate of provision of water and sanitation services within the Agenda 2030, SDG number six, which already is in our blueprint, Vision 2030, under the Constitution Article 43, is the mandate of the utilities. What we do as an association is support that enabling environment. Next slide, please. Now, uh, to draw on the opportunities that are available for private sector in WASH in Kenya, it's important for us to look at uh, the challenges bedeviling WSP. Have we lost Mr. Anthony?
Hi, Faith. Um, it, uh, looks like, lost him? it looks like Anthony has dropped off. Yeah. I suggest we give him a quick minute to see if he can join, join us again. Um, oh. Otherwise, I suggest that we just move through. Um, oh, I see that he's back. That's great. Anthony, oh. if you could unmute yourself. Sorry, great. I am unstable network. Am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. So I was talking about uh, low credit worthiness. You are aware that under the Water Act uh, 2016, which is just uh, most of, of a replica of Water Act 202, but I think fundamentally the difference is here is uh, just to appreciate that uh, water is a shared function and now the constitutional mandate of county governments relates to water and sanitation services provision. And uh, the water works uh, development agencies which have preceded the WSPs used to do investments, which they still do at national level, are the ones that were doing asset development. Most of these assets used to go in the balance sheets of the same uh, water works development agencies, but now the liability, the loan comes to the utility and that one I think has now been taken care of. So what we are looking is to get unviable utilities to into credit worthiness. Now, the other challenge is the financial performance and cost recovery. This is very tricky and uh, you've heard it has been mentioned, the issue of cost reflective tariffs. And uh, for most utilities operating in peri-urban, you find it is very difficult and the element of subsidy is required. So here you have low collection efficiencies and also high electricity bills. As we are talking now, national and county governments owe WSPs in excess of 2 billion Kenya shillings. So this is a, when we come to technical and operational efficiency, of course, non revenue water has been mentioned, which is at 43% according to impact issue number 12, translating to around 9.8 billion Kenya shillings losses per year. So these are made up of two components, both physical and commercial losses. Uh, and uh, finally, we have the policy governance and regulation and institutional arrangements. It has been already, there's consensus that uh, the water crisis is not a crisis of water itself, it's a crisis of governance. And this is where governance autonomy it's very, very important to allow utilities operate as professional entities. Now, having highlighted that, let's move to the next slide, please, and we see opportunities that are available. We are aware that for the country to achieve uh, SDG number six in terms of portable, and now the element that is included there that is key for private sector, uh, uh, to watch is the affordability. Uh, we are talking of uh, clean and affordable drinking water and also safely managed sanitation. In Kenya, we require like 1.6 trillion to achieve this within a span of now almost. And uh, from the budgetary allocation to the national government, what can be appropriated is around 600 billion. So that gives us a financing gap of 1 trillion. Uh, estimately at uh, 100 billion per, uh, per year. So this is where the private sector can come in. And uh, the question here is how can private sector partner with public sector to reduce this financing gap? Next uh, slide, please. So as an association and uh, as utilities, we see there are a lot of uh, opportunities for private sector partnership existing across the service chain in terms of water, from water abstraction, finally to billing uh, and consumer services. Within the sanitation service chain, we are looking at it from containment, emptying, conveyors, uh, treatment, and uh, end use or disposal. Next slide, please. So within the water space, you can see that right from abstraction, treatment, storage, and within the distribution or reticulation network, 
the opportunity number one for private sector that can come in strongly is in terms of finan uh, financing greenfield water supply infrastructure. And I think uh, that has been the, the concern from the other presentation that we have seen there is that uh, looking at uh, low capex infrastructure that can be financed through this. Of course, we are aware that uh, PPCs, PPPs have not had traction in the sector due to the red tape that is involved. And before you conceptualize a project, that can take almost even five years. That has been a challenge. And I think that is where also uh, Treasury needs to look into and see what is fit for the water sector, ensuring that one or taking note that this is a public good and you look at private sector is driven by private motives. So they are, this is a delicate balancing act. So within the distribution network, we have seen that we are losing a lot in terms of non-revenue water. And I think this is where we need customized technology solutions to optimize network performance. So here we are talking of improving the technical and operational efficiencies of utilities. And I think one uh, solution that has been touted is uh, having uh, the performance best uh, contracts on, uh, this could be service contracts on non-revenue water management. Under billing and consumer services, now we are talking of improving the financial performance of utilities. You realize that during COVID, utilities were hard hit because there was a moratorium by the government to ensure that uh, we keep COVID at bay, that nobody should be disconnected. So the utilities suffered and uh, with the technologies in terms of more, um, modern billing systems, smart metering and prepaid metering, where it is easier to monitor and at the same on daily basis, because the type of meters we have are only interacted once in a month, but a, a smart meter, you can interact with it on a minute by minute basis. And also if it is prepaid, money can be received at the same time. So there'll be no issue of disconnection and uh, uh, non -disconnect, either to disconnect or not disconnect. Because if you don't have tokens, then you are automatically disconnected. This is a choice of the consumer. And this one also will improve the financial efficiencies in terms of 100% collection of revenue. Now, the other one is, uh, I saw one model is in terms of uh, energy efficiencies, and I think that one is good that was presented by Jan. Uh, energy has become a monster in the sector. It's the single most largest controllable cost. As we are speaking now, WSPs in costs are in trouble, and the entire sector, we have one billion owing. So if we are able to finance alternative sources of energy, maybe solar solutions, where these ones can be used, we are not saying that we don't need Kenya power, but we also need to manage this cost to produce more water. Because I know the system at Baricho is able to do 150,000 meter cubed per day, but it's only doing 60,000 because of uh, energy challenges. So that means if we handle the energy solution through PPPs, then it is easier now to double the production at the cost without doing any other infrastructural investment. It will just be investment in renewable energy. Ne next slide, please. A minute to go. Thank you very much. So uh, in sanitation, you can see we have market solutions to enable enterprises reach the customers. You are talking of uh, alternative. We have been focusing on seaward sanitation, but here we also focus on non-seaward sanitation. So right from containment to the end use, private sector has opportunity to join uh, hands with utilities in solving this problem. Next slide. <laughs> so in conclusion, opportunities are there, but can private sector also guarantee the quality of goods and services at a reasonable cost? And this is what we are looking at. If you look at WSPs, they are only funded through tariff. And if it is not cost reflective, it is, differ it is difficult to invest. So can private sector yeah, pre-finance uh, such projects that we are talking like in terms of energy, so that if you build up a renewable system of electricity, 
what money was used to pay electricity can be used now to finance that project. Then the human right best water, we are talking about affordability and we know the private sector is, uh, its focus is profit. So I think the human right best approach to water, this is where the private sector needs to look at and balance. And I think about models for procurement and others, these ones have been sufficiently discussed. Thank you. So thank you so much, Mr. Rono. A good exposition there on the opportunities that are available. And of the cross-sectoral relationship with the energy sector, as well as the green growth discussion. I want to appreciate all the speakers who've given us so much insight. And from our interaction, it basically means we need to engage with you more because you certainly have a lot that we need to know. So we moved on to the next session where I'll invite uh, Mr. James Origa, the country programs coordinator for the 2030 Water Resources Group to take us through the next session. Welcome, Mr. James. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Faith. Uh, I think we'll take the next couple of minutes uh, just asking, uh, going through uh, a panel discussion with our participants. In addition to the panel, list who have already spoken and you've seen them we have in addition on the panel we have engineer uh engineer festas ngeno engineer festas ngeno is currently the chairman of the county executive committee members for water the council of governors is 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 is, is, is very well experienced in the water sector both in public he's worked both in private sector and also in public as including as a managing director of a utility and not just in Kenya, but also regionally. In addition, we also have Abdi Wario. Uh, Abdi Wario is the head of program of the Kenya Market Trust. He's been in the wash sector for over about 15 years now. He's done a lot of work in terms of, you know, supporting uh, public-private partnership for improved water services. We have Maureen Oginya, who is from Danko Capital. He's the head of the partnerships they have with the water uh, utilities. So. A couple of questions. Uh, I, may I request if the panelists can put up their videos so that we can see them as we go through this panel discussion so that you know, people can see who we are talking to. Uh, the first question I have is, is, is for Dr. Rona. Thank you very much. Very focused presentation you made. I think it's very clear. So one of the one in, in your presentations, one, one of the things you say that for, for the low capex operational efficiency improvement PPPs, uh, the, the PPP process allows some level of flexibility. So the question is what what kind of flexibility is allowed, uh, especially at county level, utility level PPPs, uh, relating to you know some of the safeguards that the PPP puts in place. What what kind of PPP transactions the counties are allowed? uh to get into without you no know, going through an extensive you no know, red tape uh, at, at the national level what you like to um thank you so much um you know um ultimately every ppp deal uh, must demonstrate a number of um core uh, features uh, the core rigors that need to define investment confidence um, cannot be gainsaid. Um, so there must be discipline in project selection, uh, demonstration of careful and deliberate uh, project appraisal, um, issues around viability assessments and contract certainty. Uh, so overall, there's a fine balance to be achieved. But for low capex PPPs, a heavy regulatory approach is not ideal. Um, so in terms of the light touch process, what we have in mind is essentially a process through which a lot of the bureaucratic interventions around PPP deal making are reduced. So one way of doing so is bundling appraisals as opposed to uh, doing single uh, deal appraisals, um, a sector-wide approach in terms of uh, PPP typologies for water and sanitation is something that we are considering strongly in terms of a joint advisory mandate approach. Uh, number two, refocusing the scope 
of uh, small cap PPPs in terms of uh, the feasibility study requirements. Um, what fundamentally needs to be adopted, what fundamentally needs to be taken care of, and what elements need to be uh, called out of the overall template of the feasibility study uh, requirements. Um, we are also looking at modeling and standardizing documents uh, for small cap PPPs so that we can simply replicate as opposed to originate with every transaction um, and predefining regulatory minimums uh, for what uh, cuts to the chase in terms of uh, small cap PPPs. Um, now, what we are trying to do is to address this um, partly through reducing overall bureaucracy in the PPP legal framework, but also developing specific guidelines and practice notes for this engagement space. Um, so that essentially would be the broad approach uh, without necessarily cutting corners uh, that are critical for driving investor confidence. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Ian. I think that's that's very useful, and I encourage the the participants to continue putting this in Q and A. We'll compile them, and even beyond this particular webinar, we'll be sharing, you know, coordinating, bridging the information gap, and sharing some of this information. We are we are we are glad to have Engineer Ngeno with us. You know, speaking from the governance, the county government perspective, uh, the PPP laws says that the contracting authority for what are PPPs at the WSPs. What, what engineer, what, what, what role do you see, you know, the county playing? And from your experience, what are some of the, the issues that you've seen that are timid, you know, more water sector PPPs uh, from a county government perspective? Because uh, what is lagging behind other sectors in terms of PPPs? Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, James. Allow me not to put on my video because I'm engaged with something else aside. But uh, moving on and responding to your question, um, I think one of the key things that uh, uh, that the counties can play uh, in terms of enabling the PPP programming to take place is governance. And uh, of course, I think my two colleagues, uh, or the three colleagues that made the presentations, uh, including the CEO of the Services Providers Association, was very uh, clear. And in terms of uh, what then the, the counties need to know, I, I think Dr. Tui Missing mentioned also something very important. Uh, oh, oh, engineer, you're breaking up. Can, can, can't hear you. Hello, engineer. I think you've lost uh, engineer network, but we'll we'll come back. We'll come back to you when you have a uh, better better network. Uh, I have a question for Abdi Wario. Abdi Wario is, is has, has been supporting you know a lot of local utility structure efficiency level PP. So maybe Abdi, uh, from from the experience, you're you're currently been supporting, I know, I believe it's Moranga South Water Company. What are some of the, the key lessons or uh, some of you see as the challenges in that space? Uh, and, thank you very much, Origa, uh, yeah. previous colleagues. In terms of uh, supporting localized uh, private sector engagement in the water sector, we've realized that you may require a bit of uh, maneuvering around the PPP law in the sense that most utilities do not have the capacity and the legal understanding of the entire PPP process. And therefore what we have done over the years is to see how we can tap into the Public Procurement and Disposal Act to bring on board private sector participation. And in this regard, we've realized if all due diligence is done appropriately, you, you initiate the, the, the project as required by Public Procurement and Disposal Act, there is an opportunity of bringing private sector on board. But at the same time, we have realized on the demand side, which is on the side of the utility, there are issues to do with, for instance, how to initiate a viable project, bearing in mind what the previous colleagues have mentioned in terms of the capacity to, to generate such project, and also uh, the capacity to procure and negotiate such contract under the PPP Act, particularly at utility level, becomes a huge challenge. 
and, and, and in order to address that challenge from a perspective of legal framework, and I stand to be corrected by Dr. Rono here, what we have done is to see whether there are opportunities within the Public Procurement and Disposal Act to bring private sector on board. And in this regard, we've been able to do so in both the rural, rural subsector and also in the urban subsector. In the rural subsector, for instance, in the Western part of the country, we've been able to bring on board private sector to run water utilities uh, under the Public Procurement Act, but it still gain some, some profit from running the, the services and also provide certain benefit to the communities. In the Muranga South case, for instance, we've had uh, our view management with Muranga South getting into a performance-based contracting to manage non-revenue water in two areas, that is Kenol and Kabati region. And this is not under the PPP Act, I want to make that quite clear, it's under Public Procurement and Disposal Act. And as a result of that, what we have seen is that there has been traction that has been made in terms of investing in that particular uh, area. Maybe if you can go to the next slide. In that particular area, for instance, you can see the private sector has gone ahead in terms of demarcating the entire area, investing in a billing system, putting up the necessary infrastructure, doing isolation, and at the same time, investing in modern technology such as electromagnetic meters to ensure that they are able to capture the water that goes into, in, into the system. But one thing we've realized over the last seven years is the capacity of the private sector to understand the water sector. So what, first of all, there are few private sectors who understand the water sector quite well. Number two is also the unwillingness of the private sector to invest, uh, to put the initial investment in this initiative. So that could be the experience we can share with the participant at this level. But we have tried both uh, in urban and rural. Uh, and, and what I want to make clear is that this is under Public Procurement and Disposal Act because we realize that the PPP Act was quite laborious and utilities were not willing to walk that journey. Over. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Wari. And I can see Engineer Ngen has come back. Let, I'll come back to you shortly, Engineer. Sorry for the internet loss. Let me speak to a question for Maureen from Danco Capital, speaking from a private sector perspective. You know, uh, Anthony from Mr. Anthony from Waspam Wasp mentioned that uh, one of the biggest problem is uh, upfront financing. So the expectation of utilities is that there'll be an element of pre-financing uh, of these innovations for the private sector, and then they, they recoup them from the savings made to the utility. What 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 is the private sector's experience uh, in terms of this pre-financing approach? And generally, what are some of your biggest the private sector's biggest concerns and fears in terms of partnering with WSPs from 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 the very? And I know Danco has been uh, doing pilot PPP projects with a couple of utilities. So it would be good to hear from, from your experiences around pre-financing and generally other fears, uh, concerns that has emerged in your in your years of, of work in this space. Over to you, Maureen. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, John. Jim, sorry. Um, yes, as you've mentioned, uh, Danko has participated in some PPP uh, pilots with uh, a few utilities. And um, I can say that uh, the private sector is open to PPPs. However, uh, we mostly face challenges uh, that mitigate the success of PPPs. Um, and if uh, the challenges um, are well uh, countered, they are going to, we are going to have record success in uh, the water and sanitation sector, just as our colleagues in the uh, energy sector. So some of the few challenges that we face are the procurement processes. And then we also have governance issues and uh, sustainability. So okay. if, uh, in the procurement processes, you will find that um, mostly we, you might uh, get a utility which approaches a, a private uh, entity to work with them, then maybe after the pilot has become a success and it's time to uh, go through the procurement processes. Some of the methods that are used during the procurement processes will definitely limit the success of the rolling out of projects. 
And uh, also sometimes in uh, sustainability, you find that uh, you embark on a PPP. And then when it comes to the uh, part where you have to hand over or transfer the BOTs, then payment becomes an issue or a main challenge and it delays the functionality of the PPPs. So yes, that's on my side. Thank you, thank you, Maureen. And I'll come back to, to, to Anthony to, to respond to that, you know, uh, failure of WFPs to meet the end of the bargain and for Dr. Rono to talk about this interface between the PPP Act and the Public Procurement Disposal Act. Uh, Engineer Ngeno, do you do want to continue? Sorry that we, we dropped off uh, a bit. Are you able to yeah, yeah, just make uh, a comment? Apologies. Apologies. Just my quick couple of comments on the on, on the question you asked. One of them, as I mentioned on the onset, was about the issue of governance and the and, and, and the county government providing an enabling environment. But as I alluded earlier on, the issue of transfer of assets and the ownership of this is still a, a, ton, a ton in the flesh in terms of uh, the county government engaging on the PPP, a successful PPP programming though quite a number of us or counties are, are engaging and be the challenge. But I'm happy also that the, the BPP bill 2021, I, I presume will be able to address some of the bottlenecks that were inherent in the PPP Act of 2013. Having said that, and I agree with my colleagues that I've mentioned, I think on the onset, especially for the WSPs, which are the vehicles uh, where we use in terms of accelerating the access onto water and sanitation is to look at the low capex. I, I think that presentation from uh, Dr. Rono was very, very explicit. And the low capex here, uh, and for us in, uh, as uh, owners of the agents or agents of the WSPs, is to look at the low, uh, at the, at the, at the low capex. And I'm looking at the, one of the critical things that is inhibiting progress in water and sanitation provision is a high energy cost. And if we can be able to look at the green uh, programs or green programming, for, for the WSPs, that could be an, an, an element that the PPP or the private sector can be able to engage in. Two is to look at also the commercial, um, the, the efficiencies, operational efficiencies and sustainability. And here I'm looking at either improvement on the billings uh, and, and the, and the non-revenue programming in terms of metering. So if you can focus on the low capex before we come to the high capex in terms of uh, investment from the PPP sector, then that could give us a very good uh, opportunity to, to progress. And I want to agree that the inherent problems in terms of institution, legal and uh, uh, in the water sector is what has been inhibiting the PPP programming, unlike in other sectors. And one of the progressive sectors in terms of PPP has been the energy sector and also the uh, agriculture sector. So for us in the water sector, I think we need to be able to make those regulations and be able to open up the bottlenecks. Lastly, is to mention uh, this to the PPP, the private sector players. And uh, Morina, I think I've had you mentioning as one of the private sectors. And I think two things that comes on, on board, and especially to the WSPs. One is the progressive right to uh, realization to right to water, which is enshrined in the Constitution, Article 43D, and of course, SDG call number 6.2. One of the key things that uh, uh, we look at in terms of uh, viability and sustainability of WSPs is on the tariffing. And the tariffs that we, uh, or the regulator or national uh, government per se, in realization of the right to water is in terms of the commercial viability and cost recovery tariffs only. Meaning therefore that they don't, they, the WSPs have no other alternative in terms of engagement beyond the cost that are within the tariff itself. And therefore then for the private sector, one of the key things I would urge for us to be able to progress the water sector uh, frame and open opportunities is what Anthony mentioned. And I want to repeat that, the pre-financing of the programs and recouping the proceeds thereof. And I think on the uh, outpaced financing management contracts, they have worked very well. And I think Wario mentioned that. And I, and I want to agree also with what the, the Dr. Rona mentioned. Secondly, is that the balance between the interests. I know private sector is driven by profits, but remember that article for the 3D, right to water is enshrined in the constitution. 
how do you uh, how, how do you uh, balance the right to water at the same time uh, the profits or the investment that the private sector is, is uh, putting into place? When those two are, are balanced, then we should be able to progress as a, as a sector. But uh, and I, I want to lastly mention and say this that it it, it goes uh, it beyond us as as county governments of national government. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have anyone from the Ministry of Water and Sanitation, but at least we have. Uh, the head of legal unit, Dr. Rona, from the National Treasury, that as you look at the PPV uh, bill 2021, uh, Hello, engineer, we, we can, you're breaking up a lot, then I cannot hear you much. Hello, engineer. Hello, engineer again. Seeing in the water at 20, uh, water 2016, which, remember, there's still an issue. And, and mentioning that, uh, I think I've made my point. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Anthony, on the, the pre-financing and some of the contract security issues that the private sector has, has, has raised, uh, that seems to be a big concern for private sector actors that uh, what security uh, they have uh, that will keep your end of the bargain? Hmm? Two things. Hmm. Am I audible? Yeah, you are. We can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Two things that we are looking into here. One is that if you look at the tariff structure for water utilities, this is done uh, for three or five years. And again, when you are in negotiating this tariff with the regulator, you are not sure that uh, you will get it immediately because it is political. Because you find when it comes to public participation, especially when it is taken back to uh, the counties. Now, this is where it becomes very, very difficult to implement it. And I think one of the things we are looking at, we are looking at a tariff, and uh, this is what we resolved yesterday because we have been in Mombasa discussing these challenges, that we want now an indexed tariff for the water sector. If you look at that tariff for Kenya Power, it's very clear. The unit cost charge is very clear. Then you have the pass-through costs. But for the tariff for the water sector is a block increasing tariff. It doesn't show clearly what the customer is paying for. So we want it to be segregated so that it is very clear what the customer is paying for and these other pass-through costs. You've realized in the tariff, there's always a component of the loan which has been financed, which is very good. So if that component is put there clearly and you negotiate for a PPP, so if there is an additional something to the bill, it will be very clear that that utility is implementing a project and the cost of maybe before pre-financing or how would you finance? You finance it from the tariff. So the cost is embedded in the tariff. And this can be done at any Hello, hello, Anthony. You, you're breaking up a lot. We can't hear you so well. We'll We, we, we can barely we can barely hear you. I don't know it's just my end of everybody else. Uh, sorry, sorry, Anthony. We'll, we'll have to cut you short. I can we can barely hear you. Uh, do do you want to say what you say in the last one minute, please? We didn't get that. Yes, what, what, what I've said is that uh, what we want here is now a structured arrangement where the county governments can come in and guarantee. Then in that arrangement, you can have an escrow account so that if you have invested in meters, it is worth like 20 million or 30 million. It is very clear that uh, one, if it is in terms of pre-financing, that any profits that accrue, the money that will accrue, it will be very clear. If it is coming in the ratio of 70 to 30, 70 goes to the utility and 30% goes automatically 
to the private sector so that you don't have issues in there about it. And this one has happened and we know it can happen. So it is about uh, structuring uh, the entire arrangement because we believe the technology is the one that is driving us now to acceleration in realization of SDG6 and other rights that have been spoken about. Thank, thank you. That's that's very clear, that last point. I, I would want to ask Dr. Rono the last question because I intend that you finish at 12. I would like to hand over to Emily to close at around two minutes to 12. So Dr. Rono, what's, what's your wisdom on some of these questions that have been raised? Security of contract, you know, interface between the PPP Act and the public disposal. We'll, we'll, we'll appreciate your wisdom on some of these questions and concerns. Over to you, Dr. Uh, uh, th yeah, thank you, thank you, James. Um, you know, uh, PPPs uh, and the PPP um, model of doing business is not um, is not a monopoly for for this kind of uh, transactions. Um, on private sector capital mobilization, um, certainly can um, um, can be locked in under the. Uh, public procurement and asset disposal act. In fact, uh, there was a 2015 and 2017 amendment to the uh, general procurement law uh, that makes it possible for strategic partnerships um, under the specially permitted procurement methods um, within the context of that law um, that allows for these kinds of deal structures to actually happen. So what uh, Buenawario has spoken to um, is quite in order. What we do uh, say, however, is that um, uh, public agencies um, planning investment programs uh, will uh, always have the prerogative of determining um, what uh, procurement and project delivery mechanisms to apply to transactions. What we do encourage is that um, on a balance of uh, and on a hierarchy of needs, uh, the determination on what methodology to apply um, should be one that is judiciously exercised. Um, so, so certainly, um, I do believe that uh, the PPP Act and uh, the general procurement law will continue to remain relevant for uh, different forms of interventions in the water and sanitation sector, as indeed they are in the wider landscape of public investments. Um, I think moving on to the other issues, um, Ultimately, what, what the investing community um, are looking for, uh, particularly from the private sector uh, side, um, is the ability to ensure that um, a $1 in um, is one uh, potentially and a quarter dollar out um, in any public investment program. Because we do know that uh, these are not free lunches by the private sector. They are in it for business um, and, and the government understands that. Um, the frameworks for doing these types of work therefore require um, that viability assessments become part and parcel of what we do need to take care of. And overall, uh, contract certainty in terms of uh, guarantees against expropriation, guarantees against contract uh, repudiation, uh, guarantees against, for instance, in this sector, tariff adjustments that uh, undermine commercial viability of transactions. All of these issues become part and parcel of what makes contract certainty um, um, a bankability consideration. So um, ultimately, if government is to lock in private sector participation in any form uh, in the water and sanitation value chains, um, it is inevitable that um, certainty of engagement, um, certainty of unpredictability um, of uh, behaviors across the board on both the public and the private sector side, um, as well as reliability on commitments made under instruments that uh, under, uh, underwrite the investment uh, become core value drivers in terms of uh, what we need to achieve. I do believe um, that this will promote um, expanded uh, interest in this space. Um, and these are the kinds of things that we need to continually build uh, the kinds of ethics that we need to lock in um, to ensure sustainability of uh, partnerships in this space. Um, thank you.
Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rickens. We do not have sufficient time to follow up and send written feedback to those particular questions that have not been uh, addressed so far. So allow me to request Emily Oita to, to close the, the session for us. Over to you, Emily. Thank you, James. Um, this indeed was a very insightful uh, session. Uh, uh, now saying thank you very much. It was a very interesting session. And I think when I was coming into it, I was expecting it to be the, you know, the usual um, you, you, you know, web, webinar conversations that we're all experiencing, but I think I've learned uh, quite a lot and um, I can see from the questions that we are seeing, there's a lot of information and questions that people are sharing. So this is really good. So um, as KEPSA, we note that uh, this partnership with uh, the 2030 uh, Water Resources Group um, and, and this, you know, three-part series webinar is, is just a conversation. Uh, starter in moving us from you know just talking to action, and really we are looking forward to this partnership growing and 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 seeing us doing uh, bigger things faster as we as we move ahead in this post pandemic world. So we appreciate the panelists who join us today, and especially uh, Mr. Ambugo from Waspa, Mr. Wario from KMT, Ms. Uh, Maureen from Danko, Jan from the uh, JJ Advisory. Dr. Rono from the PPP unit, Engineer Ngeno, uh, the Chairman, Council of Governors, Water, um, Forestry and Mining, CECs Caucus. Uh, as KEPSA, we are happy to be a part of this conversation starter in trying to trigger investments from the private sector to increase access to uh, water and sanitation. The case study presented to us today shows that the PPP model is indeed viable. We are sold. And, um, and we will certainly be sharing this with our colleagues who maybe did not make it uh, for this meeting. We invite you to share with us the policy uh, recommendations that will unlock investments in this sector. This is to the wider audience. And our private, uh, our public-private dialogue platform at KEPSA is a key instrument to, in, to, influence, to influence policy change and to aim to create an enabling working environment for, for the private sector. So thank you so much everybody for joining us. We look forward to engaging further. Asante. Thank you very much. I uh, wish everybody a lovely day. Now, I think you, you can log out now. Thank you.